no good artist will ever be living in isolation from the society that they live in, the reality that they live in, because empathy is very much part of being an artist. And I think the artists we have in front of us, each in their own way, are, are doing exactly that. And um, I wanted to bring some historical examples before, you turn, before we turn to them. If we think of Picasso's Guernica, Picasso, an artist, 1937, um, the uh, Nazi Germany um, basically bombs this Basque town to complete smithereens. Uh, he's an artist. Again, you know, he's in his studio painting and sculpting and doing his thing. And he's in Paris. And he is so exercised by this extraordinary act of cruelty and violence that he produces one of the greatest masterpieces of art history, which you can all see in Madrid, you know, Guernica. It is the greatest war painting ever, and it's by Picasso. And probably when people think of that Basque town, they immediately think of that piece by Picasso. Um, moving forward in time, we have Andy Warhol's electric chair, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. You know, Andy Warhol doing this kind of uh, series of paintings that show the electric chair. What is that if not a comment on contemporary America? We have an artist here who will be also commenting on contemporary America in a few brief minutes. Um, and also a comment on capital punishment. And finally, we have Ai Weiwei, who um, very recently has left China and is living in Europe. And he is very much exercised by the plight of international refugees. And I don't know if any of you went to Prague when he had this giant inflatable boat full of faceless refugees. It's a rubber sculpture, and it's absolutely ginormous. It would fill this entire hall, and it's suspended. Did any of you see that, by the way, in Prague or anywhere else? I didn't either, but um, anyway, so that's again an example of an artist who is definitely riffing on contemporary times. So my first um, artist here is, is Kitrahan Kahana. And are you a Canadian-American? Canadian-American artist. You have to turn that on, and it comes on after about three seconds. One, two. Yeah, OK. Uh, yes, yeah, Canadian-American. OK, let me, let me give a little uh, introduction to what you do. Um, Kitra is a, is a photojournalist, and she works for National Geographic um, a lot, but she is also obviously an artist, a, a photographic artist. You will see some of her works hanging here in the exhibition. This is true of all three artists. They have works here in the festival that you can go and see. Uh, she has an ongoing series, which we won't be seeing here, but it's an ongoing series about vagabonds, or as she calls them, American nomads. And I think you can find them if you go to her website, which you will search under her name, Kitra Kahana. And th this is basically a portrait of the homeless the roaming, and you know, the vagabonds, as it were, who are living in America today. These are contemporary pictures of present day America. And basically, she holds a mirror up to American society, and the image that's reflected back is not a very pretty one. It's not the American dream. It's sort of like sometimes the American nightmare. And um, in one image, there are two people and a dog, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kitra, they are sleeping in a toilet. Can you talk a little bit about that work and talk about this whole series? Sure. So um, I guess in 2009, I, was, I started, I went on an assignment for Colors magazine. Um, I pitched this story about, you know, I do all this research, I'm a journalist, and I heard this, I'd heard that parents were come, going to rainbow gatherings searching for their runaway children. I was like, what is that? That sounds crazy. And they're just showing up there and like, like asking people at rain, rainbow gatherings are these um, gatherings in the woods that happen annually like across the world, but also in the United States uh, where people live in the forests. Um, and so I went there and met started meeting travelers, nomads, hobos, train hoppers, and 
for the next few years proceeded to travel with them across the United States. So um, that image, uh, there was a small group of, of hobos. We're, like I met up with them in many different spaces across the country and we were traveling from Chicago to Seattle and um, on that and initially we'd started with train hopping and then end, ended up having to hitchhike the rest of the way when we were like pulled off a train um, or like kicked up kicked or like discovered by the rail cops um, and then on that particular day it was raining and so I don't I don't recall it like I was also sleeping in the bathroom at a rest stop. Oh, you were? Yeah, I mean, because we, we were always together. So everything that they did, I did. Um, I did my master's thesis on it in visual anthropology, and so it was very much embedded in their And world. so what, can you talk about these people and um, their life and on their condition? Because they're living in 21st century America, and yet, you know, this is, happening. So yeah. are they homeless out of choice, out of necessity? All, all of the above. It's Can you a, talk a little bit about them and who they are? Yeah, um, the nomadic community is very much made up of, I mean, it's a, it's a world of individuals, but then there's, there's people who are homeless by choice, let's say, kind of um, college dropouts, raised middle class maybe, and just disillusioned by capitalism and and also this kind of yearning for freedom. So everything is kind of framed within freedom. And then there are other people I traveled with on the road who, uh, you know, they were from the foster care system or, you know, kicked out of their homes because of, because they were from the LGBTQ community. Um, so it's kind of this, this space where people redefine whatever their circumstances are. And it's, it's also one of the few spaces I've found in America where people from very different socioeconomic backgrounds come together and kind of equalize and say, we're all part of the same community and we're all going to you know, support each other or you know, go into these bands together. Um, so what is this series telling us about the America of today? I mean, are you tr trying to tell us something? Yeah, I mean, so from one, from one side, I was definitely documenting kind of ethnographically a community, a world. But on the flip side, I found that so much of what this community has to say speaks to the America of today. The fact that you have an entire kind of class of people that can live off of the excesses and the waste and dumpster diving and all, just the clothes that are thrown out. And, and there is, within that community, this idea of like, you know, we're, li we're living off the waste, but we're living like kings. And that was the feeling. That's, that's um, wonderful. Um, let's move to admire our next artist. It's, um, your last name is Kamud Zengereri, is that correct? Um, Admire, you, you, you can see the work 1972 here by Admire and by um, fellow artist Rachel Monosov, who is from Israel originally. And it's right here at Unfinished. It's that wall of black and white photographs, I don't know if you saw, of a wedding between Admire and between Rachel. And um, this is kind of an extraordinary work because originally, uh, so it's 23 black and white portraits, or sorry, prints, or photographs, documenting a wedding that was supposed to be kind of a make-believe wedding, which they staged as a sort of artistic installation. So they pretended to marry each other in 1972 Rhodesia, before Zimbabwe became Zimbabwe, it was Rhodesia, it was obviously a, a part of colonial Africa. and. Um, interracial marriage in those days was completely, well, if not banned, totally impossible. I mean, how could a white woman and a black man get married? You know, it was really quite almost impossible. And yet in that picture, in those pictures, you think you're seeing this wedding in 1972 of these two people. And it's a very beautiful kind of comment on, as I said, history, society, politics. 
But as it turns out, they really did end up marrying each other. They really did become man and wife through this piece of art and build a house together in Zimbabwe. So Admire, can I ask you what this work tells us? What are you trying to say about <clears throat> contemporary Zimbabwe? Uh, the work was really about exploring borders and boundaries. Um, so what the work was, uh, was really about, uh, Zimbabwe is not really like a perfect picture, um, but there's a picture about Zimbabwe that exists. And this picture is also like mainly based on the history of Zimbabwe. And uh, this history has been sort of like um, the ongoing conversation that sort of like maybe kind of like, a, uh, I would probably say like, um, I am a product of that history and that history um, sort of like stagnated over the sort of like um, the, the generation that exists within my generation was that. So, sorry, history stagnated, meaning, meaning that, meaning what? Um, well, you have to speak louder. Well, in Zimbabwe, um, there is the so-called uh, born free generation. Sorry, border free generation. Born free. Okay. So the born free generation are actually the generation that came after Zim Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, yeah. so after independence. So this yeah. was uh, the Robert Mugabe era, which um, is just sort of like left, but is still sort of like holding. So this history is very, very important in Zimbabwe because it, you can still feel the effect and uh, it's still sort of like clinging and stinging. So when we were actually making this work, we had like a series of long conversation through um, uh, Skype, emails and stuff about uh, how to, I mean, how we can probably rewrite our own story and our own narrative. But uh, the whole idea was really like tapping into the history of Rhodesia yeah. and then bringing it into the contemporary history of uh, rewriting what is marriage, what is union yeah. between two people. So as artists, uh, we started exploring ways in which how we can uh, bring out our own story and reinvent. Yeah. yeah, because basically, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know, but Rhodesia, um, between 1972 and 1979, I guess, um, there was a very, very vicious uh, civil war in Rhodesia. Uh, and uh, because, well, obviously, the, the people in Rhodesia, there were whites and non-whites, and they both, I mean, the, the non-whites obviously wanted independence. And so there was, it was very, very brutal. And then in 1979, uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, and for much of that history, was ruled by a man called Robert Mugabe, who was, you know, pretty much a dictator. And he, after God knows how many decades, was finally removed. How many decades? 37 years. 37 years. He was, you know, 37 years of being president. Imagine having a president for 37 years. Imagine if we had Donald Trump for 37 years. I mean, that would be really something, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> God forbid, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, he was, you know, not that remote from Trump in terms of... So what was it like living in the Zimbabwe under Mugabe? I mean, did you feel free? I mean... Um, uh, I think Robert Mugabe had, like, a kind of, like, two faces. The Robert Mugabe before and the Robert Mugabe um, yeah. after. So those are two different Mugabes. But I think Mugabe was just the same. So the thing is, um, he only maybe became more even visible of who he was because of that uh, longer stay in power. So things yeah. began to sort of like uh, unshed and begin to sort of like become very, very clear. So uh, for me, like I grew up when Robert Mugabe was in power and um, it's just last year that uh, Mugabe was sort of like thrown out of power. But uh, in a way, um, the way how I see it, Robert Mugabe is still in power. He's, I mean, he has not left. Um, how I can put it was, um, um, you are always sort of like on the lookout over your shoulder. Because, looking, uh, looking over your shoulder. Yeah, amongst uh, 
he created, uh, I would probably say, kind of like a myth or kind of like a scenario where even in your own house you don't mention the word Robert Mugabe <laughs> because you don't know who to trust. So that's uh, how it was and um, I think people can, could just disappear without a trace. So, yeah. Police state dictatorship. It was a serious leap. Disappearing. State, yeah. 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 And so can I, before going on to, uh, to Oana, can I please ask you to explain how this marriage work came about, this photographic um, fake news, I guess it is. <laughs> um, I don't know if we would say fake news because uh, the events uh, within all the photographs really happened in real life. But uh, there's uh, events that happened, uh, it's called 1972, and if you look at the, the work, it's like a well-lived life where the whole, you have uh, a wedding and then you have kids uh, that are actually born in 1972 and actually age in 1972. So this is like a perfect sort of like bubble, but uh, which um, I think happened in real life, in real time. And uh, to place it, I mean, would be for us to frame it in 1972 because it is the space where it can actually maybe have its own uh, life and if its own body. I, yeah. So the marriage took place because you had to actually go through and you had to be the groom and the, and the bride and everything, but you were intending it as a kind of artwork and then it became life, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, like all forms of art, art work, the, yeah. It's art imitating yeah. life, life, imitating yeah. art. Life imitating art, yeah. Yeah. And that's great. I mean, I think that's like a fairy tale. So I invite you to go and downstairs and see the fairy tale because it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful work because I thought this was really 1972. I thought... These guys, I mean, they're going to be a lot older, you know, that was 40 years ago, so I'll be in front of a couple of elderly people. And then I found out, no, 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 these are people today behave, pretending to live in 1972, pretending to get married then. And of course, he's very young, you know, he grew up under um, Robert Mugabe. Before Mugabe in 1972. <laughs> uh, well, when were you born now? 1981. <laughs> 1981. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You weren't even born then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, Oana, um, on to you, Oana Paula Weiner is a German-Romanian artist here who also has an exhibition, uh, an installation with various pieces in it. Um, basically, her work, uh, which she will explain very shortly, uh, reflects the reality of living in a consumer society and also in the present-day European Union, in present-day Germany. These are all kind of environments that she thinks about. Again, she is not working in isolation. She is working as part of these, um, these realities. And, and later today, she will play something quite extraordinary, an extraordinary piece of conceptual music. And it's composed from all her receipts which she collected over a whole year. And I mean receipts like shopping and supermarket and cafe and bar, whatever. And uh, she will basically transcribe the numbers into musical notes. I'm not, sh not sure that how that's gonna sound. Is it gonna sound like Nicholas Yar, which we saw here yesterday? Who knows, is it gonna be electronic? Anyway, can you tell us a little bit about this uh, exercise, Juana? Uh. Hello. Hi. Um, I, I think I, uh, it. Yeah. I'm. So. No. Yeah. It. it uh, I think it will sound. It will not sound like anything else known. It's just like you should come there and, and just see. It's a harmonica, um, and you uh, play the. The holes, uh, these ten holes, uh, you can uh, tra tra transcribe the, the, uh, the numbers from the receipts in, uh, in these this ten holes, and now you have the, the, 
10, um, 10 numbers, yeah. And it will... So um, will we be playing the music? No, no, no. no I, you <laughs> if you want, you can also try it, but no, I... Um, uh, I intend to play myself, yeah, just for... And so what are you telling us with these receipts? What is your message here? Um, a message... Uh, I mean, no, I think, consumer yeah, yeah. society, what is it that no, you're No, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's more like, yeah, maybe um, it's an open, um, um, open message. But I, I didn't thought uh, about the uh, message of uh, if should have a message for for a uh, spectator as I thought about um, uh, doing this work um, but more about um, I, I was in Paris uh, that time and I didn't um, um, got the I, I couldn't uh, check my my account uh, to see how much money do I still have and so I had to to keep some some kind of records and yeah and uh, it's it was then I, I began to play in my studio and um, just first as a research to, to see how how it uh, um, how it works if, if I combine these two elements uh, like uh, real real life with uh, music instrument that I it happened it happened to to uh, to have it uh, by me and um, by by playing these notes and by seeing these receipts uh, yeah it, you you have an, um, like um, you are conscious Don't worry. I mean, we don't need to talk about that work. We're not here to talk about. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. Works. But, but uh, it's it's very important to to explain. Maybe I, I can find another an, another uh, word because um, I'm um, I try I try, but I'm maybe say I'm it in German. Again, German Someone speaks uh, German. Yeah. What's in German? Um, What's the word in German? Uh, wahrnehmen. Does on, uh, anyone speak German? Perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perception. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. yeah. So Thank you. you um, what What happens with uh, with you when you uh, when you try to to put these expensive uh, expenses in uh, into music? Uh, it becomes uh, nothing. It's 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 not it's not nothing, but it's all around you, it's uh, yeah. and it's in the air. It's a value of uh, um, so m money. It's like a, um, cons uh, money. Mm. Money is like it becomes an abstraction or it comes valueless. Yeah, 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 yeah. It loses yeah, but, its value. But, but without money, you cannot. Uh, you cannot. Uh, really exist. I, yeah. I, don't really I mean, I think money is, is uh, something that you think about um, quite a bit. There's another work which you can all see is a video work here in the exhibition. And basically, I think um, you had a residency or a scholarship or, uh, in Timisoara, yeah, right, yeah. in Romania. And um, basically, Oana went to this part of uh, Romania in Timisoara, and she had her video camera, and um, she started taking real Romanian coins, was it 10 lai coins? 10, ten bun, uh, yeah. 10, ten bun. lai, ten, uh, is that how you different. pronounce it? And she bun. started throwing them on the tram tracks, you know, and so the tram would go over them and these coins would lose, you know, their value because the face would be wiped out. And she has the video on the screen and she's actually glued pieces of these erased coins onto that video. It's a very, uh, it's a very evocative kind of work. And, and so, again, there you are expressing the fact that you were saying these Romanian coins, even to Romanians, they go to the supermarket and they just kind of empty them there because they, they're not worth 
much. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. That it's uh, that's true. That's true. That not worth much. But I, I think um, for me it was uh, more like a transformation. Uh, uh, right. Just um, doing uh, work without nothing or or with everything. Uh, yeah. And this was uh, this money that. Uh, I always keep it. I, I always took uh, every cent I, I got from uh, so every rest uh, um, money I got from uh, from uh, buying something in a supermarket. Um, I, I didn't. And then I, I, I thought, yeah, this this is the perfect material. Actually, the perfect material to uh, to work with because it's uh, yeah. It, and we were talking a little bit yesterday. Um, by the way, after this, I'm going to open it to questions. If you have any, please get some ready. Um, again, this is an exchange with you. Um, I wondered what your feelings are, because we were talking yesterday. You said that living in Germany now, um, you had some thoughts on the rise of the far right in Germany. And I wanted to ask you, what is it like for you living in Germany as an artist, and how do you feel about this movement becoming stronger? Yeah, it's, it's not so easy, because it's not so easy to speak about it, because it's, a, a, it's a really frightening. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's not just in Germany, but in the whole uh, Europe, and uh, not only Europe. Um, we have it... Um, yeah, very near um, in our in our lives, uh, and you think, um, yeah, I, I I hope it will it will not go uh, harder or just because I I'm it, much of the this thing happens today don't sometimes don't, don't have, uh, don't, don't make sense, because you are, um, a lot of Romanians are, for example, living um, um, somewhere else, and um, still you have also, also here in this country, you have um, a lot of, uh, of this um, far right, and, um, um, yeah. yeah, and you and think this I is kind know. of, you feel that this is, there's a danger in this? Or is it party like the National Front in France, which just renamed itself, been around for 30 years, you know? Um, I mean, it came close to, but never really gained power. And so do you think this yeah. is going to be a phenomenon like a party on the fringes? Or are you really worried that parties like this will take power? So, well, in Hungary, I mean, we do have one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have we have a lot of examples um, of uh, ruling ruling uh, in these countries, and um, I think it's uh, it's also about a lot of, uh, of of fear that it's present today. But I'm I, I don't I I still believe that um, I still believe that that. Yeah, there is a possibility to. I I, I don't believe that that it will somehow change the or modificate the the uh, situation today. But I hope and I don't believe that uh, that it is a danger. So we, we uh, I I don't think we we just have to to think uh, that history will will not uh, be repeated or. or we, not possible to be repeated or uh, repeat your, uh, it's, itself or, or yeah. Um, I hope you realize that we have artists from three continents here. So the kind of almost the entire globe is represented somehow by uh, North America, Africa, and uh, and in Europe. And uh, I'm from the Middle East, so if you throw me in, then you have a bigger kind of thing. <laughs> I'm from Iran. Um, so I wondered if there were any questions. And, and can I get you to sort of uh, keep quiet, because we can hear every little voice. Um, 
Is there a question? Uh, I really invite you to ask questions because then we feel that we are entering in dialogue. Thank you. Do you describe a real art or not real art? And how do you find yourself in the 21st century nowadays as artist and the inspiration and the people, other artists interaction? Let, let, let me kind of try and translate that. I mean, I think that I don't know, I think the question is that, um, how do you feel about being an artist? I mean, are you in a community of artists and are you connected as part of a community of artists or, or are you kind of more living and working in isolation? Um, how do you interact with the world, basically? I guess I, because I, I do documentary work where I'm taking, I'm, I'm taking someone else someone else's reality and translating it through me kind of as a medium. And so, in, and then I, there's other works that I do that come from kind of the inside out. And I, in, at least in my process, when I'm kind of witnessing someone else's reality, I really feel that the artwork, yes, there's the final product, there's the image, there's the aesthetics, all of which I love, but the kind of higher art is the relational art, is the face-to-face, -face, is witnessing that other person's existence and building that trust and that relationship outside of, the, outside of technology, outside of the kind of digital spheres. Just sitting with someone, hearing their story and opening myself up to that story. And I, I feel like, you know, the, the larger topic of this conversation is how we kind of reflect the political sphere, the social sphere. And for me, the, like, especially in this day and age when everything feels so, like such a bombardment on the psyche, like, like Instagram, all, all these different things, that, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't feel real. I feel like this ability to build a relationship to the point where someone's so vulnerable that they're going to expose themselves and tell their story through me. That can only happen in real life. It, it Not through Skype and through device and camera well, and it, it, FaceTime. I, I feel like that act of witnessing someone is a political act. It's saying, I see you. I see who you are. In your, in, in your fullness and the fullness of this relationship. Do we have another question or two? Thank you. Hi, I have a question for Kitra. Um, I was wondering if you could share your personal experience while traveling with the community. I guess I am really asked, questioning myself if there was a very um, deep moment where you started questioning your lifestyle and how was the return to your normal day-to-day -day life? So there is no normal. There's no normal day-to-day. I, mean, normal. Day. I, I don't like... She's an artist. There's no normal. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the kind of the strange reality of my existence is I live through other people's lives. So I'm constantly moving from one world to another and kind of joining those worlds um, to, to varying degrees of, clo you know, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. In the case of the traveling kids, it was very close. Um, but at the time I entered, I was yearning for it. I was yearning for friendship. I had, um, I was living in, I had come back from, uh, actually I was living in Kishinev and I was working on a project about, um, righteous Gentiles and the people that they saved and their ongoing relationships. And I was spending all this time with like octogenarians and I was like, wait, I'm in my early 20s, like I wanna find, I wanna find people who have this inner creative like freedom the way that I do. And so like, what's a story I can connect to that would kind of heal my spirit as well um, or, or feed that yearning. Um, so I. I always try to open very, like to enter very open, just non-judgmental. Who are you? How can I just join in? So I, I think maybe for like my parents at the time, they had like questions like, oh, how, like how deep into this world are you gonna go? But it's also the, the beauty of that community is 
everyone, there's this understanding that everyone has come to this place of, you know, redefining the American dream um, for whatever personal reason. So there's this, there's, there is a very strong sense of insularity in that community, but once you're in that community, there isn't that kind of questioning of like, who are you? Like, do you deserve to be here? It's like, oh, you understand, you're a part of us. Can I put the question to you, Admire, that was uh, being asked earlier, which is to say, how do you uh, connect with um, other artists as you sit in Zimbabwe making works that represent Zimbabwe in the Venice Biennale, for instance? I mean, you're obviously very much in part of the art world, and yet you're working in a country that is perhaps geographically remote from London, New York, you know, Berlin. And, and what is the communication and conversation that you have with the rest of the art world or other artists? I, I, I guess uh, for me, the, the major sort of like communication is really about uh, sort of like, um, I would say like to, to, to be able to sort of like fetch to the other side. And the other side, it's, it's, it's like what sort of like separates us but what separates us, uh, I mean, is actually defined in a lot of different ways. I mean, like sometimes it's a, like people say borders, but uh, borders uh, exist in many different uh, ways. What kind of borders do you see besides geographical borders? Uh, there is, um, like, um, well, I, I have something which is very, like, maybe, Every time I travel, I'm always usually like the last person to get on the plane. <laughs> That's Why? a border. I mean, I don't know, like, yeah, I'm always the last person, a lot of questions and stuff and things, uh, which is also like, uh, maybe also like the, the same scenario also like uh, about uh, Zimbabwe, about me, identity as well. And um, yeah, I guess also for art, it's also like something also that exists like there. There's still also like uh, a lot of borders that uh, needs mm -hmm. to be re sort of like invented and uh, re like questioned. Um, for the Venice Biennale, we did a piece uh, together, me and Rachel. It was really the hardest uh, sort of like piece to try and pitch in the Venice Biennale because of uh, this is a Zimbabwean pavilion. Yeah. And uh, as a Zimbabwean artist, uh, I'm coming from that perspective where I'm saying that um, um, the theme of the Binale was talking about borders as well. So in this, we're actually pushing for the two of us, uh, where the other artist, my partner, is Israeli and Jewish, and uh, yeah. for Israeli and uh, Russian to be at the Zimbabwean pavilion was something which was also like uh, something we had to actually try you and to negotiate and fight with the government exactly. for the artistic right of the project. Yes, because yeah. Admire's uh, partner is um, Israeli, so Jewish, Israeli, he is Zimbabwean, and to create a work involving both of them for the Venice Biennale, obviously there were borders there, invisible borders going up. Um, Oana, I wanted to ask you that question and how in your daily practice and as an artist you interact with other artists or with the art world. Um. Yeah, um, actually I'm basically I'm trying to interact with not just with other uh, artists and uh, with many other um, um, Ordinary people, or yeah, or, yeah, ordinary people. I or mean, friends, uh, or yeah, um, everybody who wants to uh, to participate or just to to be in. Con in uh, so I'm 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 not in contact with me. I'm not trying to uh, to stay to my. I I, I think this um, this also this political situation today. It's it's not giving. It's it's not the right time to 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 spend in. The, in the studio by yourself. So I'm. I'm. Uh, since I think two years ago, I started um, 
this uh, one one radio project with this uh, uh, idea in um, uh, back of my head uh, that how how can I as an artist how can I uh, observe and, and make myself as a transformer or transporter of I don't know what I'm yeah. Whatever you have, is you have a pop-up, you have like a radio station, improvised radio station, and so who are the people coming it's on? It's not really improvised, this is a really radio, radio station. It's a really radio station. Well, yeah, and so who are the people who are coming on, and, and what's going, what, what can I hear if I tune in? Yeah, yeah, so um, this, this year, um, there, there were um, from... Um, um, uh, Engineer, engineer, um, engineers. engineers, yeah, engineers, uh, psychologists, and uh, yeah, also artists or designers and uh, um, economic. Uh, and so, but, but okay, but so all these people come on, but then what happens? Do you interview them or? Uh, yeah, we, we we talk. Yeah, we, about we talk what? about. Yeah, about. Um, Actually, I, I have a couple of questions to, to begin uh, about what they are doing uh, for, and then, yeah, it uh, it goes into the the fears. What what, what is fear? Because fear is uh, is like um, so. It's a radio program about fear, and that sounds pretty good like to me. A, yeah. Yeah, and that sounds great. It's all in German. I don't speak German, right? No, it's not in German. Oh. Yeah. Oh, what is it's it? in. Uh, it depends on uh, the comfortability of the uh, inter interview. Uh, interview. If that's okay with you, then I think we will wrap up our conversation because the hour is now up. Um, thank you very, very much to the three of you for bringing such compelling perspectives to to the subject and. Uh, Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.